Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to our presentation. I'd like to introduce ourselves briefly. Uh, I'm Bob Gilmore, and as Valentin said, I'm a uh, research fellow here at uh, Orkin. And I have with me my two other fine colleagues from Trio Scoda Turo, so Alfred Schmidt and Elisabeth Stolt. And we'll be joined also in due course by uh, Lucia De Rico and by a special guest performer who will become clear later on. So this is uh, Nicola Vicentino, A Second Life. In Rome, in 1551, a public dispute took place between two Italian composers and music theorists of some renown, Vicente Lusitano and Nicola Vicentino. The dispute was not about money or property or personal reputation, but about the nature of contemporary musical harmony. It was sparked by a performance of a polyphonic setting of the plain chant Regina Cherry at a private concert in a palace owned by a wealthy banker overlooking the River Tiber. Lusitano and Vicentino began arguing whether the music of the Regina Cherry could be understood as being composed purely in the diatonic mode. Lusitano thought it could, Vicentino thought it could not. The debate became so heated that Vicentino, in a flamboyant gesture, possibly trying to impress his patron, Ippolito II, the Cardinal of Ferrara, who was present, challenged Lusitano to a formal public debate, staking two gold scudi on the outcome. Lusitano accepted. Frustratingly, history does not record the name of the composer of the Regina Cherry, so we cannot judge the matter for ourselves. It's even possible that it was a setting by either Lusitano or Vicentino. Vicentino's argument was that the music could not be understood simply as an embodiment of the diatonic mode, but also of the two other types of mode as known to the ancient Greeks, the chromatic and the enharmonic. In his day, the enharmonic mode had lost its attraction and was all but defunct, but it had an almost magical appeal for Vicentino. He had studied ancient Greek music and theory as a younger man, and held to the belief, in itself quite a widespread one, that ancient Greek music had powers unknown to the modern world. The power to <coughs> sway human passions, to attract and to tame animals, to cure physical and mental ailments. These views, of course, flew in the face of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, but Vicentino took them seriously and tried to persuade others to do likewise. He believed that the enharmonic mode was the most beautiful mode of all, appropriate for the highest sorts of music, music for private venues and aristocratic tastes, whereas diatonic music of the sort championed by Lusitano, so Vicentino claimed, appealed to plebeian tastes and was responsible for the coarse, vulgar music that many of the ancient authors had decried. Here are the three modes of which Vicentino spoke. Uh, I'll play them so you can hear them clearly. First of all, the diatonic mode, which is the one that to us is probably the most familiar.
The debate between Lusitano and Pochettino began on the morning of Tuesday, June 2nd, 1551, in the Church of Santa Maria in Rome, before a panel of three judges. It resumed two days later in the Palazzo Monte Giordano, residence of Cardinal Hippolito. But one of the judges, Dan Ketz, was called away from Rome on that day on personal business and could not attend. The next morning he returned, asked to be informed of what had transpired in his absence, and received two somewhat contradictory accounts from Lusitano and Vicettino. Therefore, he then asked for their statements in writing. Vicentino quickly produced a short memorandum, thinking that was all that was required. Whereupon Lusitano, wanting the upper hand, wrote a very much longer account, contradicting Vicentino on numerous details. A final session of the debate was held on Sunday, June the 7th, after Mass in the Apostolic Chapel in the Vatican, at the request of Hippolito. All three judges were now present, as were the papal choir, a group of ecclesiastical dignitaries, and an assembly of learned persons. The debate resumed, but although coherent and focused, did not seem to point towards any form of resolution. The judges then suggested that the two written statements be read aloud in an attempt to conclude matters. Being already quite familiar with the documents, the judges then quickly reached the decision, declaring Lusitano the victor. Vicentino, suppressing his rage at the unfairness of the procedure, agreed to hand over, in good grace, his two gold scudi. Vicentino reacted to his defeat in two ways. Initially, he was enraged by the verdict, claimed he was unfairly treated, and was even later accused by one of the judges of propagating lies and falsifying documents and signatures, all of which Vicentino denied. After some time had passed, the second phase of his reaction took over, a more positive one. In an effort to vindicate himself, he composed music in the enharmonic mode to prove its validity and its beauty. He commissioned a new instrument, which he called the Archicembalo, a harpsichord with two manuals and split keys on the black notes that would allow him to play the precise tunings of his enharmonic mode in all its transpositions. That instrument still exists in Bologna. And in 1555, at the age of 44, he published his magnum opus, a large treatise setting out his theories, entitled L'Antica Musica Ridotto alla Moderna Pratica, Ancient Music Adapted to Modern Practice. Sadly, much of Vicentino's enharmonic music has not survived. A letter to the Duke of Mantua, written in late 1555, inquires humbly whether the book of ten five-voice madrigals he had sent had been performed, admitting that their new practice might make them seem strange to the singers. But no such book has come down to us. Fortunately, this treatise I just mentioned contains four compositions embodying this new practice, and from this source we can examine closely the nature of Vicentino's musical thought. Here is our arrangement of the first of these compositions, a four-voice Latin madrigal in honour of his patron, Hippolyto, entitled Musica Prisca Caput. Almost as though he was setting out his stall, the madrigal has three verses, and if you listen carefully, you can hear the difference. The first is in the diatonic mode, the second in the chromatic mode, and the third in the enharmonic mode. This enables the characteristic harmonies of each to resonate clearly.
That final verse, with its highly subtle shades of pitch and microtonal transposition of triads, sounds very strange to our ears today, but it would have sounded just as strange to Vicentino's contemporaries. It's probably a fairly typical example of his enharmonic practice. Musica Prisca Caput is the only one of the four compositions in Vicentino's treatise that is actually finished, a performable piece. Of the other three, which are all in Italian, two others are incomplete, and one is merely a fragment. We are therefore left with the question of whether he considered these other three madrigals simply as exercises or experiments in showing how to compose in the enharmonic mode, or whether they are included as examples from completed compositions uh, that are now lost. Yet, it is these three fragmentary compositions that have turned out for us to be the most fruitful parts of his treatise and mark the beginnings of what we are calling, slightly tongue-in-cheek, Vicentino's second life. In a crucial passage in Book 3 of his treatise, the treatise is rather large and has five books, but in Book 3, in which these madrigals all appear, Vicentino makes a telling, if controversial, statement he comments, Students are advised that wonderful secrets are found in such compositions, for every work based on this method can be sung in three ways. To make the comparison and to permit the composition to improve and make better listening, you begin by singing it without any accidentals, that is, without flats, naturals, sharps, or enharmonic dots. Dots above the note head is Vicentino's way in his treatise of notating the quarter tones of the enharmonic mode. The result will be music without much harmonic sweetness because of the diatonic mixture. The second time the composition is sung with the flats, naturals and sharp, but still without the enharmonic dots. The entire composition will become sweetly chromatic. And the third time, when sung with all the accidentals as written, the composition will become mixed chromatic and enharmonic, both sweet and gentle. Thus, any sort of enharmonic and chromatic composition can be sung either with or without the accidentals, so as to change its nature. To test this, you'll perform one of the incomplete madrigals now in all three ways, so you can hear for yourself its changing nature. First in its diatonic form, then chromatically, and finally enharmonically, the Chintima's preferred version. This madrigal is Dolce Mio Ben, my sweet love, these are the sweet eyes with which so sweetly you extinguish me, alas. So in your handout, which you possibly have, uh, the inner pages show you the, a modern edition of the score in its enharmonic form, uh, should you wish to follow it. So first we'll attempt the diatonic version, which is uh, with no flats or sharps or anything apart from the key signature. Mm.
Now I will try it again chromatically, so with all the sharps and flats, but not with the microtonal accidentals. In this edition, the Chintino's dots are replaced with what look like quarter tone symbols, if you know those symbols. So the chromatic version. Like the end of the parole bass has to sing alas all by himself. Um, and finally, um, the end harmonic version. that taking Vicentino at his word poses various problems. The diatonic version of the Madrigal, whether or not one retains the key signature about which Vicentino's treatise is anything but clear, gives rise to a nasty, unprepared and unresolved triton in bar 14, and another one in bar 17, as well as to other instances where Vicentino breaks his own modal rules. These mistakes mean that Vicentino's three versions, despite his claims, are not all viable, and perhaps suggests that Vicentino's wonderful secrets, so-called, need perhaps a more creative approach than a simple performance. We need, as it were, to open the music up to some creative rethinking. With this thought in mind, I asked 13 composer friends to make responses to Vicentino's fragments. Today, you'll perform the first four of these. 
None are simple idiomatic completions of the fragments. All four composers have used, in very different ways, details of Vicentino's pieces to enter new worlds of the imagination. First, Allo Studio con Nicola by Harold Muntz from Cologne is based freely on fragments of the texts of the Madrigals, Vicentino's own plus others. None of Vicentino's own music actually appears in his piece. Perhaps only the spirit remains, as though we're hearing Vicentino in a dream. For this, I'm very happy to say we're joined by uh, Lucia De Rico on bass guitar.
fragment, the incomplete work, has an uncertain status, an uncertain foothold in music history. Music comes down to us as fragments for various reasons, either because work or inspiration was interrupted or refused to flow, so that the fragment is all there is, or because a complete manuscript has been partly lost or destroyed, leaving tantalizing traces of what once there was. Or, more unusually, because a fragment was what the composer always intended to produce. In every case, the fragment seems to pull us constantly away from its textual existence into the realm of what might have been or what might once have been. Generally unperformable as it is, if only for reasons of brevity, the fragment pushes beyond the limits of the historical record and reveals another world of which we have no knowledge. What survives the ravages of time is shown to be an arbitrary collection shaped by forces over which we have little control. Did Vicentino actually complete all four madrigals? The state of unknowing frustrates our wish for certainty, for an urtext. It frustrates our wish to circumscribe history, effectively to limit it through knowledge. And we should remember that in Vicentino's case, there is no ongoing performance tradition upon which to build or against which to kick. His enharmonic music, including the pieces in this treatise, lay unperformed and essentially unknown for over four centuries. But where we have nothing, we can invent. A different sort of engagement with the world becomes possible, an engagement through the medium of artistic creation. Our second example of such creation is William Brooks's composition after Vicentino. In making After Vicentino, two things went as I had imagined, and two things were unexpected. The imagined components are easily deduced from the assignment. I chose to structure the piece in two ways. I allowed materials to accumulate to the center, more or less, where a fragment of Vicentino's fragment appears almost unmodified. And then the materials dissolve towards the end. And I used the three modes, diatonic, chromatic, and enharmonic, in succession, with some overlaps, so that each occupies roughly one-third of the piece. The unexpected parts of the process arose from the study of two somewhat peripheral matters. I was interested in the phonetic qualities of the text, and individual phonemes were projected across the entire piece, accumulating in the center of necessity because of the Vicentino quotation. What results is a timbral shift from low format, bland vowels and sounds to shrill, incisive ones. Second, I became fascinated with Vicentino's rules for melodic construction, and I tried to apply these strictly. The severe melodic constraints produced an unusual, for me, economy of material. The intrusion of the unexpected is always the best part of composing, and I am grateful for the disruptions I encountered.
the reliable information that we have about the genome you know, from surviving documents and historical sources. The reality is that we know very little about the man himself. In the title page of his treatise, he styles himself the Reverendo Monsignor Don Nicola Vecitino, implying that he was a priest. This is confirmed by various sources, yet we otherwise know almost nothing about this aspect of Vecitino's life. It's difficult, too, to form a mental image of this man, with his strange musical practices, esoteric theories, and argumentative nature. We may think of him as a humanist, a scholar engaged in the recovery of ancient Greek and Roman knowledge, except that he knew no Greek, and that we have no evidence that he consulted any original documents or sources. Much of the material in his treatise is based on a close reading of a single source by the 6th century Roman philosopher Boethius. Sometimes this reliance leads him into confusion, especially regarding technical matters to do with tuning, about which his own treatise is not at all clear. And yet, by his activities, he did much to spread awareness of aspects <coughs> of ancient culture. Alternatively, should we regard Vicentino, as some of his contemporaries apparently did, in more dubious terms, as a lazy scholar, a composer who broke his own rules, even a sort of showman or a charlatan selling to gullible patrons his rare bottles of snake oil, his enharmonic compositions with all his extravagant claims for them. Perhaps it's more accurate to see him as almost an avant-garde figure, a visionary ahead of his time, who finally, in the modern era, has come back to life now that his compositions, with their extreme performance demands, seem no longer quite so impossible. Certainly, what little we know of his life and character is sprinkled with details that make him seem quite modern. He travelled around the main centres of northern Italy with a dedicated group of singers who performed his strange music, not always with success. At one such concert in Ravenna in the early 1560s, the performance of one of his enharmonic madrigals ended in a shambles, when a tenor lost his place and, so a contemporary account states, could not be set aright. One of Vicentino's singers, Giacomo Finetti, who may or may not have been the same man, admitted that he had to abandon performing his master's enharmonic music in order to make a proper living. He could have been talking in 2014. I've sometimes wondered what this shambles of a performance actually sounded like, but perhaps there's actually no need to wonder. Thank you to our special guest, Valentin Ward. <laughs> and to Lucia, who very kindly agreed to say the also part for us. Um, these sorts of imaginings bring us, if not verifiably closer to Vicentino, at least into contact with aspects of his world and concerns. Beyond facts, we have our imaginations, our interpretations. Beyond our imaginations, we have our dreams, where Vicentino has yet a further existence. Our dreams are a second life, famously claimed the French 19th century writer Gérard de Nerval at the beginning of his last prose composition, Aurelia. 
Ja, Frau Bosan. A drowsy numbness steals over our thoughts and it becomes impossible to determine the precise point at which the self in some other form continues to carry on the work of existence. Little by little the dim cavern is suffused with lights and emerging from its shadowy depths the pale figures who dwell in limbo come into view, solemn and still. Then the tableau takes on shape. A new clarity illuminates these bizarre apparitions and sets them in motion. The spirit world opens for us. The opening of the spirit world, however we may wish to define that uncanny sensation, was, I confess, close to my initial feeling on hearing the third of these responses to Vicentino. Madonna il poco dolce by Lucia del Rico. What I tried to do in this version of Vicentino's madrigal Madonna il poco dolce is not to take possession of a musical code and manipulate it, but rather to distill a sensation that could function as the greatest common divisor between Vicentino's original text and an extant experience of it. The result is a suspension a static and yet animated state of being, a compressed musical space with no development and direction.
Our project, Nikola Vicentino, A Second Life, is not a musicological attempt to tidy up Vicentino's legacy, to regard his idiosyncratic harmonies and his fragmentary compositions simply as further rediscovered pieces of the jigsaw that is the Western art music canon. Rather, we have accepted his work as the puzzling, inconsistent, touching, inspiring collection of notations, texts, instruments, and ideas that it is. If we compare him to Gesualdo, say, or Monteverdi, figures with whom he has things in common, he seems merely inadequate. If, in contrast, we approach his work imaginatively, as though it were entering a second life, it has the power to inspire us in new ways. As a temporary close to this first phase of our endeavour, here is the fourth and last of the responses to Vicentino we have so far collected. Christopher Fox's Dolce Bianto. I see this piece as a sort of dialogue conducted across hundreds of years between my composer living now and Vicentino. Obviously we know different sorts of things. So for instance, the way the harmony is organised is derived from a series of vertical moments in Vicentino's original madrigal, but arranged as if they were discrete chords, and this is predominantly what happens in the keyboard part. The other thing which I've taken from Vicentino but used in a different way is his tuning system, and obviously I come to ideas about new tuning systems with the hindsight of the someone who lives after the, the invention of equal temperament and then the gradual implementation of equal temperament. But what attracted me so much about Vicentino was the, the effective uh, ideas he had, the ways in which he imagined different intervals having different emotional connotations. And I've tried to bring some of that to the setting of this, his lovely haunting text with its beautiful balance between the more hopeful and the more desperate aspects of being in love.
composers Harold Munson of Cologne and Bill Brooks, who uh, works here, and Lucia Delico. Deli 